Welcome to episode 33 of the Twig Snapper Podcast. Today I'm with Bruce Horsch, he's an MTU hockey alumni. He was on the initial roster for the 1980 Olympic team. How are you doing on this cold fall morning? Uh, it's, it's, this is uh, the top of the country. Yeah. You know, you, you, know what you, you, you take what you get. Right, yeah, I mean, I think it's supposed to be 67 on Sunday, so you, you never know. Sure. Figured we could start talking about your time with MTU and then kind of work forward. So when you were at Tech, you guys won a national championship, and then you were runner-up the following year? Correct, yeah. So, kind of talk about that. I mean, you know, two years, you guys are one of the best teams in the country. And how would that play into you as a goalie and, like, the whole team and, and your chemistry and everything? Well, that was the key word that you, you brought up is chemistry. We had great chemistry, we had great talent, and we had great leadership and great coaching. So, you know, you put those factors all together and it came together at the right time. I was just fortunate to be a freshman walking in, uh, you know, playing uh, maybe, I don't know, six, seven, eight games that first year. And, uh, but we had a goaltender ahead of me that was phenomenal, and Jimmy Warden. And, uh, you know, that first year, and then uh, all of a sudden we lost some of those guys, three key players off that team that could have come back the next year to the 76 Olympic team. And uh, with uh, Stevie Jensen and uh, Jimmy Warden and uh, Paulie Jensen, and they all could have come back. They were still had eligibility to play for us, and, but we we had uh, quite a bit of our scoring back from the, the NCAA team too. So it was uh, uh, would have helped to have those other three players back, I'm sure. But you know we made it all the way to the end, and uh, unfortunately the last game didn't work out for us. Yeah. So what was the NCAA championship back like in the 70s. I mean, I know now hockey is getting pushed to the forefront of NCAA sports. It's a huge deal. There's a lot of media around it. What was the surrounding media and all that like back then? You know, probably not to the extent you have here. I mean, every kid has a phone now. You know everything instantly. And uh, back then, at least I had to wait next morning to read in the, <clears throat> read in the newspaper what happened or see it on the news or something. But, um, no, it was a, it was a big deal in, in our, you know, I would say the WCHA and the ECAC were the two leagues basically uh, playing at that time, and uh, the CCHA was just a kind of a up and coming league, just getting started back in the '70s. So uh, the number of schools that were back there weren't that many, and only four teams made it to the NCAA's. You know, and uh, usually the first two teams out of the WCHA made it, and the first two teams out of the ECAC made it, made it to the final four. So it was a lot more. It was a lot harder to get in if you were one of those teams that wasn't as well known. Exactly. I mean, there was probably teams on in the WCHA that depth-wise, maybe the third and fourth place team might have been as good as the second place team in the ECAC at the time. But you know, you didn't have that opportunity. Right. You had to come out of. We never played to a final championship either in the WCHA. You had your playoffs, and uh, eight eight teams made it to the playoffs, and you got it down to two teams. And that, that was it. There was no champion. Oh. Those two teams went to the NCAA. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't know, do you know when they changed that rule and they started reforming the playoffs to what it is now? Boy, um, it wasn't much longer after that because the CCHA started coming in and they wanted, you know, my senior year, the CCHA uh, ended up having a team in the NCAA and the WCHA only got one team in there. And we were a third place team at that time. and thought we were going to get a, a bid to go there because right. the number one team in the WCHA that, at that time was Denver and they were on probation. They had used to be illegal junior players or something so they were on probation. So we were technically the number two team in the WCHA that year and Bowling Green all of a sudden came out of uh, with Coach Ron Mason who was well known Michigan State coach but he was at Bowling Green and they, they came out and uh, had a one game knockout with, well, we got beat out by Wisconsin in our playoff that year. And Wisconsin went to the NWC, or NCAA, and then uh, I think it was Colorado College got beat out by maybe Bowling Green or something like that. But yeah. Yeah, it definitely changed the, the whole makeup of college hockey. Well, and they had, you know, your, your um, regionals were two out of three initially. You know, you'd, yeah. play, you'd bring a school into Tech here. And, in a regional, and it could be somebody from the east or whatever. And uh, when they made that change to 12 teams, maybe they had four regional sites, and they had 
you know, you played a two out of three. Yeah. And, uh, now it's one one guy, one game knockout, and that's it. Right, right. Yeah. It makes it a lot more competitive. Makes the games mean yeah. a little bit more too, because you've got to play to win. Well, and back when we played in the WCHA playoffs, your series wasn't uh, on your wins; it was on your total goals. So you could split the series, but if you got one more goal than the other team over the weekend, you you were the you were the winner of that series. Wow. So so if you had good firepower, you had a better chance. Good firepower or, or a stingy defense, one yeah, or the other. Right. So, yeah, you needed one or the other, yeah, or a combination of both. And then you played when Coach John McGinnis was here. Obviously, he's one of the great coaches of college hockey and at Michigan Tech. What was he like as a coach? Well, he was a, a player's coach. You know, he he would talk to you every day. I mean, he was around the players, and uh, on the ice, he would talk to you a lot. And, and he was very uh, like a father figure. You know, a lot of us came here, and he, he was very honest with you. He came out right away, and he'd go around the room after about the first week or so of practice and say, look, look to your right, look to your left. He says, but there's only going to be about two or three of you that might end up playing pro hockey out of this room. He says, but every one of you guys are going to get your degree. And, you know, and he was very adamant about that. You know, I, I know I came through a time when, you know, I would say 98% of the guys that I came in with and that I played with from my freshman year on, got their degree. If one guy maybe didn't get it, that would be a good day. So he, he valued the school and the hockey kind of together. Exactly. But he valued actually the school. You know, don't get me wrong, he wanted to win, but he valued that we were here for an education. Right. And, uh, and sometimes, like guys like me, it took me a couple years to realize that, boy, yeah, I can get a degree from here. You know, you don't think about that when you first started out, when you're, you, you know, hockey's very heavy on your mind, but, you know, and all of a sudden, uh, the education really kicks in, and, and I'm fortunate to have both a hockey and a degree from here. Right, definitely. Yeah, and I think it's still that way, you know, with guys coming here to play. You know, Tech, you know, for some other sports, people say it's hard to recruit because Tech's such an academic school, but you get a lot of those athletes that are hard workers, and they come in here, and you look at the team GPAs, overall GPAs for the hockey team and the football team, and they list off how many guys have four points and above 3.5, right. and it's really incredible. See the makeup. Well, as uh, things transition from more schools recruiting more kids, you know, more kids were being taken out of the pool. Um, you know, Tech had to find their niche, and that was basically what they did. I mean, I know out of 26 players, when I walked in as a freshman, only three were engineers, the rest were in business or, or in social sciences. Yeah. You know, and that's transition over. I'll bet you they're probably not. You know, there's a, a bigger balance of more engineers coming here to play hockey now than right. probably back at that time. Yeah, definitely. So then after your time at Tech, you played in the IHL and the AHL a little bit before the Olympic team. So were you, you know, talking with teams in your senior year at Tech to try to get pro contracts, or how did that kind of all shake out? Well, the, the way the draft worked, um, when I was a sophomore here at Tech, the draft was for players under the 20, 20 years old, so I was, you know, eligible for the draft in my sophomore year at Tech, and uh, I got drafted by the, the Canadians. Yeah. Okay, so that they, they had my rights, and so as but you know you, you played all your four years, and uh, and at the end, then they started talking to you and saying you know what their plans are or what they want to do, and um, I was uh, like. Uh, I think I was drafted in the ninth round, so it wasn't like I was uh, right up there knocking on the door for a contract. <laughs> but uh, and and basically what they did is they invited me to camp. Okay, and uh, so when I graduated that next fall, I was in Montreal's camp for a period of time, and then I was in Halifax, our well-known social board insurers, mm -hmm. which is in Halifax, and I was in their, their farm team for a bit during the training camp. And then I needed a place to play. They had three goalies already in Halifax. And they said, you can stay, but you're number three right now, or we can put you in the IHL somewhere, and uh, we'll, you get to play, right. and then we'll see where things go. And so I, I took that option and went to play in Flint for a while. So right around uh, November, I ended up, after all the training camps were over and everything else, I, I, I got bounced around. I went to about three different IHL teams because Montreal didn't have an affiliate. So I got bounced around, and I finally landed in Flint played there and, uh, and then I got called up to the American League in Halifax. And right after the first of the year I got called up, went back to Flint and then at the end of the year I got called up to Halifax. 
So then, while you were playing, how did the, it work out with the Olympic team then? Did they call you and offer you to come out for a tryout? How did that, that work? Well, they, they invited, um, prior to the Olympics that summer, they invited in the neighborhood of 70 some players to come out to Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. And they basically, um, they had it divided into teams. I played for the team. I actually, they, they had, prior to my, um, the summer when I graduated, I went to the Olympic Sports Festival. Actually, John McGinnis was our coach there. So we went out to Colorado Springs at the Air Force Academy. They had four different regions playing. And so it was kind of a pre-camp for the Olympics, you know, per se. They wanted yeah. to look at who was out there right there. And everybody goes back and plays in their colleges or wherever they were going to play. Or in my case, I because I was in, I didn't sign a pro contract, I was still an amateur. So then I went to play in Halifax that year. So then they invited the 70 players out who they wanted to vet for the, the top 26 players for the Olympic team. And, um, so that's where I, I made the team out there. And uh, and as it will, you'll have it, Johnny Rockwell, another goaltender at Michigan Tech, and I were partners on that team. And, and we ended up being the best team out there. We won the championship and everything else. And, uh, and uh, you know, one of us had to make it, but we probably, in essence, both of us were good enough to make it at that time. Yeah. So, have you seen the, the movie Miracle that Disney made in the early 2000s? I, I have. I have. What, do, what, do, what are your thoughts on it, on how they portrayed what, I, you know, what happened? Well, you know, some of it, you know, you got to realize it's a movie. Right. Okay. So, some of that stuff is based on fact, but some of it's stretched a little bit, in my opinion. Um, just to give you a little background, <clears throat> I was with the Olympic team when we made it in July, late July, and then stayed with them until right around this time, Thanksgiving time. And um, then I went up to Halifax on an emergency basis because they had goalies hurt. So I went there right around December 1st, late, late uh, November, and stayed there until January 1st. So I was off the team, off the Olympic team during that period. So some of that movie is based on stuff I wasn't there for. Right. Um, you know, the, the, the famous uh, skate in uh, Norway. Well, you know, I played that game. Okay, but if you watch the movie, that's Jimmy Craig skating up and down. Jimmy Craig wasn't even on the ice because there was three of us. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he was in the stands that day. Because one of us is always in the stands and two of us were either dressed for right. the game. So Janicek and I, and, and, and you know, it was a 3-3 tie and you know, we did not play well. I, I'll admit I didn't even play well, but it was like three breakaways, they, you know, for, they were fortunate they got three goals on us. And uh, it, that part about us skating, yes, it was true. You know, he, Brooks said, he goes to myself and Janice, like, he says, you guys can go get undressed. And I looked at Steve and I said, I'm not getting undressed. I'm staying out here. And then I stayed out, Steve, stayed out. So we skated with, you know, we did everything else. Yeah. I, I was frustrated to be, I, I was the goalie. Right. You know, so I stayed out there. and. Uh, so anyway, you know, they made a lot of emphasis about uh, where you're from and all that in the, in the beginning. I don't recall that. I mean, those are things I don't recall. You know, they had pictures of guys wearing their own college jerseys in practice. Yeah. That didn't happen. I mean, we all had practice jerseys on that were USA Jack jerseys and stuff. But. So, you know, when you get to the Olympics itself, I, I wasn't there. Right. Okay, so I can't vouch for what, but... When you look at that movie, what, what players stand out in your mind when they, just from the movie, what players stand out in your mind? Mike Rizzioni, Jack O'Callaghan, uh, Craig. You know, like okay, those, where are they from? All out east. Yeah. Who do you think were the, the guys who were the consultants for the movie? They were all from out east. Well, Mike was and so was uh, Jimmy. Okay, yeah. Okay, I don't know if Callahan was involved in it. I don't think he was. If you know any history about the U.S. Olympic team, who do you think the best players were on that team? Oh, I'm trying to think now. Um, How about Mark Johnson? Yeah. How about Bill Broughton? How about uh, Christensen? How, How about Kenny Morrow? How about Ramsey? Okay. Did you notice that much in the movie? No, you no, did, their, did, their characters are much more minimal. Yeah. So, from that standpoint, me knowing, being on the ice with them, right. those were the guys that were, and, and don't get me wrong, Mike Ruzioni and I, when I was on the team, were really good friends. You know, and, and, uh, and actually, Jimmy and I were good friends, but 
you know, that movie was portraying a little different flavor than I thought when I was there. Yeah. So from that standpoint, that that's uh, but it's it, it's a great movie. Yeah. It's a made for T V movie and it's a great movie and it's a very popular movie and it should be. You know? I um interviewed Billy Schneider, Buzz Schneider's kid, okay. who was wow. in the movie, played yeah. his dad, yeah. and he said one of the differences is when they're talking about the skating in Norway, how it didn't end with the Ruzioni saying, like, I played for the USA, right. he said that, was it Mark Johnson got pissed off and, like, skated off the ice and something like that? Well, I don't know if he did. He may have, you know, yeah. I don't know if he did. Um, it was true, though. They We skated, and then when they turned the lights off, we thought, great, we can get off the ice. No. He just we kept going. Kept going. <laughs> kept going and uh, um, I, I honestly you know when you're in a fatigue state like that I don't even know how, how it stopped yeah you know how it yeah, he said it. that Mark Johnson got pissed yeah. off like smashed a stick and said some things to her and skated off but you know they changed it because it's a Disney movie oh sure you know, they got to make it family friendly and right all of that stuff. that's what I'm saying yeah I, I could say I just remember it didn't end like, <laughs> like it was, yeah, you know, I, mean, I know it didn't end that way but it's a movie it's a good movie was there actually a Herb Brooks test? Like in the movie, they, they list off all the names um, and they say, here's some homework to show the guys at the bar doing this test. Yeah, you know, and it, it didn't happen that way. They sent all this stuff out to the 70 candidates in the summer. And it was just, you know, it was kind of like a psychological test. They wanted to see if, how you fit, you know. Um, you know, like one of those, you know, do you like this or do you like that type of thing, you know what I mean? Right. And, you know, they wanted to see how guys fit in. Obviously, it was some psychological type of test, um, and I don't know if Jimmy took it or not. You know, but uh, he, obviously, he probably did, Jimmy, because that's how they portrayed it. <laughs> right. You know, and uh, uh, so yeah, there there was a test that was sent home to us. There was a workout sent home to us, seventy guys, and you know, prior to getting there, they wanted you to come in shape. They wanted you to, you know, and then they, they did the psychological thing. Uh, the movie portrayed that Herbie already had twenty six guys before we even sat went on the ice. Yeah. Uh, well, if that was the case, I wouldn't have made the team because I made the team by being out there. Yeah. Because I ended up statistically and just the way I played one of the best goalies out there at that time. You know, Jimmy Craig did not have a good turn when we were out there. Jimmy only played one game, one half a game, gave up six goals and they, they said he was hurt and he didn't play. And, and so, in the movie, they kind of portray it as like, you know, herd has got it. Already in mind. Oh, well, he had him marked on. Okay. He was there. Yeah. He had some. Don't get me wrong, because they had to commit to some of these guys, or they were going to turn pro. Right. You know. Okay. Yeah. So they, they got to say like you're you're going to be on the team, otherwise they were. They had to guarantee them. some of these guys. Him for sure. Kenny Morrill for sure. Probably a guy like uh, Mark Johnson. Mm -hmm. Both, you know, I mean, some of those guys were committed to the, the team. And uh, you know, I'll tell you right now. Out of those 70 guys, you could have picked another 26 guys and had almost just as good a team. Right. You know what I mean? But the guys who did make it, you could have had a great team. And speaking of that, guys playing pro, in the movie, they've got Jack talking to Jim, and he says, where's Joe Mullen? And he's like, well, he's got 30000 sitting in his you know, bank yeah. account. Yeah. Sign pro and that's probably true. Yeah. I mean, he did sign before. He didn't even come out there. He signed. And I don't know how many others they lost that didn't. Yeah. Ask the same thing. Wait a year. You know, we're guaranteed a spot. But you know, yeah. Believe me, there were good players out there. Right. You know, and, and when I say good players, they're good college players. They weren't pro players yet. They were good college. Players. Right. Which is the impressive thing, considering what they end up doing against the, the Russians who are playing together for year after year, winning all those Olympic right. teams. Right. Right. Um, well, Herb had a plan. Yeah. And he stuck. Yeah, he he was not popular. <laughs> Believe me, he wasn't popular. But that was by design. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure how popular he was when he was a coach at the University of Minnesota with his players. Right. You know what I mean? Um, I never had a problem with her. I mean, the, the only problem I had was he he didn't want to cut people. Believe me, nobody does. Right. And I basically went in and forced his hand and said, "Where do I sit?" In, in, right around the first of February, because I had not been with the team. I came back in mid January, early January, and I was with them a month. And then they had to make some decisions. Now, if it would have been the way the Olympics are right now, I would have been with that team. Right. Because you could take three goalies, you could take extra defense, you could take extra points. But at that time, there were uh, 20 players, was all you could take.
and I and I could be wrong. And, you know, the movie portrays a lot about Ralph Cox. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure he was the last guy cut. <laughs> you know, I I could say I was right in the mix of being one of the last guys cut too. Right. right. And the movie they show them ripping your name well, off yeah. the locker, but yeah. you know. But you know, there was um, a couple guys that were already gone and weren't even there at the end. Of that. Well, actually, when I was in Europe, I had a roommate. Out of the 26 guys, uh, Gary Ross was from Rosso, Minnesota, and he had played in the 76 Olympics. When we got back from the European, we were gone for three weeks over in Europe. He, he he decided he didn't want to keep going and pursue it. Yeah. So now we're down to 25. And then um, they had an arrangement with the, the minor pro league that some guys, if they were affiliated with some of these teams, that they could send those guys for just games to be played. They weren't playing with the Olympic team, they wanted to be getting into games. Yeah. So a guy like Les Auger was a, a golfer, a defenseman. He ended up not being there at the end. Uh, and uh, Dave Delich, who's from Colorado College, he, he did not be there, he was not there at the end. So now you're down to just 23 of us. You know, so three of us basically at the right. end of the is it true, like in the movie, they had him bring in that guy from the Gophers, Timmy Haar? Yeah, is that, that, that is actually true. happened? That is true, yes. Yeah, and they had a couple other guys in mind too, but uh, Timmy, Timmy was a phenomenal scorer. Yeah. yeah he, he could score, and uh, I was not there when he was there. Okay. That was during the time I was gone. But yes, they did bring him in. Okay. Yeah. Do you think it hurt you to leave and go play and not be with the team for those months? You know, it, it, it's hard to say. You know, it's hard to say. Um, you know, when you when you do, Jimmy was the guy, okay? I mean, from day one, Jimmy was the guy. And that's who they were putting their, you know, putting their, you know, team on his back. And Janicek and I, you know, I thought we were even. Yeah. Okay, but so I didn't do anything to get better. Bet, I wasn't any better than him, but I don't think I was any worse than him. Okay, if you're coaching him for four years at the University of Minnesota, and I'm over at Michigan Tech, who are you going to take? Yeah, take the guy, you know. and, and not that that was the that right. That's what I would do. Yeah, exactly. You know? And I'm sure he well, didn't do it a little. You know, he knew what he was getting. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. what kind of teams do you, do you guys play against? I know in the movie that you guys played Norway. It says something about playing Harvard. So, what kind of teams are you guys playing in that schedule of preparation? Um, to start with, we we went over to Europe and we played uh, uh, in Holland. So we played. Uh, the Netherlands, we played two two games against them, and uh, then we went to uh, Finland and played six games against their like their pro teams. You, they're not pro, but that they're top elite teams. Right. Over there, we played six games, and then we finished the trip with two games against the Norwegian national team. Well, that first game was a tie, the one we skated in. Yeah. They the, the, their national team didn't come play us the next game. They sent their national junior team, <laughs> and we beat them like twelve to nothing. Ten and not been fault I mean, for one, we we're going to beat them anyway because after what happened with the scheme, right? You're not gonna but, but they didn't. They didn't send their. They they didn't send their their national team there. They sent their junior team. Wow. So it was kind of, a, kind of a, They they had a moral victory just getting a tie from in the U.S. at that time. Right, and that was that was good enough for them. They didn't want to apparently. <laughs> so, but it was it was a real neat trip. So we were over there for about three weeks. Then we came back. We probably had a schedule of about maybe a dozen college teams, uh, and then we had a schedule with uh, was the Central League at the time. It would be like Omaha City, uh, Omaha and uh, Oklahoma City and Tulsa and Dallas and Fort Worth. Those teams that were out there in the Central League. Yeah. And we actually were on on every one of those teams' schedule, and the games that we played against them counted in their standings. So they, they all had to play us. Yeah. And they counted against their, their league. So they'd actually give you guys full effort because it wasn't just an Well, it was an important game. Right. right. It, it was an important, important for them. Yeah. Uh, we played a little bit in uh, the, we played an IHL All-Star team. And then I wasn't there with them, but I, I think we probably played the Canadian Olympic or Canadian national team probably about five or six times during that, that run. Okay. Yeah. In different venues. Yeah. So you said that, you know, Herb wasn't liked with different, you know, the way he did things. You know, in the movie, you know, they portray him as the, kind of the tough guy, and he's got all these, these lines that everyone knows if they watch the movie. He's just like one-liners he's got. Well, uh, John Harrington, okay, uh, 
he he kept a notebook on all of us. He did. He kept a notebook on us. They were uh, uh, Herbieisms, <laughs> Brooks Brooksisms, and you know, yeah, like you know, some of them you couldn't repeat because some of the stuff you'd say on the ice. But right. he he kept a, a book on all the different sayings that he'd say. You know, you know, I'd like you probably heard the one where. Uh, uh, you're getting worse and worse every day, and right now you're in the next week. You know, stuff like that. He'd say, you know, right? You know, and so he didn't. He didn't bother the goaltenders. We had a goalie coach, yeah, uh, Warren Strelo, and he he just didn't want to bother the goaltenders much. He stayed away from us in practices and stuff. You know, we did our thing. You know, we were doing what we had to do and work with the goalie coach. And, but uh, <clears throat> but yeah, he 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 had a. It was uh, us against him. That's what he wanted. Right. He wanted to join everybody from different places in the U.S., bring everybody together from different colleges, and you know, unite that as one team. So his way of thinking was, let's have them focus on me, you know, and not on each other. Yeah. You know. Speaking of that, in the movie they show everyone's kind of at each other's throats in the beginning. The guys from Minnesota and Boston. Was there some tension in the beginning with guys from different schools? You know, I didn't feel it, yeah. but you know, there was some truth to it. I mean, Minnesota, um, when when we were when we, I don't know if that was happening, but when when we played in Denver for the national championship, uh, BU in Minnesota had a bench player brawl in the national yeah. semifinals. So I don't know if that was part of it or not. You know, because uh, Callahan might have been a freshman at that time. Right. Yeah. It, 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 and it was the only it was probably either a junior that time. So there might have been a little bit of a pullover, you know, uh, carry over from that. Yeah, but, some bad blood, but yeah, but you know, I didn't feel like, I mean, and that, that might just be my attitude. I, when I'm on a team, I'm part of a team. I'm not an individual. Yeah. Team, so. so then after your, your time with the Olympic team, you, you played in the IHL and the AHL a little bit more, and then you stopped playing. What was your decision on, on stopping, you know, to try to pursue playing pro or you know, um, well, for one, I, I, I left in February and I hooked on with Toledo in the IHL. And, uh, you know, when, when they were going through the whole Olympics, I was with Toledo playing for Toledo. And uh, when they when they actually won the gold medal against Finland, I was on a bus going to Fort Wayne, Indiana. So I, I didn't actually get to see, although a lot of that, <clears throat> a lot of those things were taped delayed anyway that night for yeah. TV coverage and everything else. So I saw it then. But, and uh, I happened to be home. Uh, I was in Dearborn at the time, commuting to Toledo. And when they beat the Russians, we get the Canadian station in the Detroit area. So the Canadian station carried it live. The U.S. station did not. So I didn't get a chance to see. I was coming back from practice. Yeah. So I, I didn't know what happened. Then I turned. You know, I wanted to watch the game that night. So I still didn't know what happened. But as you watched uh, the the people around the, the, the booth of the, the announcers and all that stuff, you could tell something really, really good happened. Yeah. So then I watched the game from that perspective. But anyway, yeah, I, I ended up in the IHL and uh, stayed with Toledo right through till finished the year out there. But I had gotten hurt where I uh, I was out for about four weeks while I was down there. And uh, I just decided I wanted to move on and I wanted to get into coaching. So I, uh, I just threw my name out there. And, that summer and uh, decided that one to start coaching. Yeah, and you coached at Ferris and then you coached at Tech for a little bit. Why did you decide to switch schools? Because you wanted to come back to where you played? Or? Well, as a coaching, you know, you're, you're beholding to your record, you're beholding to the kids that you recruit. And uh, when I was at Ferris, uh, I got hired by a head coach who was only there two years and uh, Rick Duffett and then uh, got switched over to a guy by the name of Dick Bertrand. And Dick Bertrand and I had different philosophies. <laughs> the way he recruited and whatnot, and, uh, we probably butted heads a little bit too much. So in essence, I, I got let go. And uh, I left the sport for a year, went over to Minnesota and took a job in, a, in an industrial salesman. And uh, I wasn't there six months, and that's when John McGinnis was gonna be retiring. And both Jimmy Nargain and uh, Herb I'm sorry, that when I went to Ferris, mm -hmm. the, the switchover happened. Yeah. Okay, so when I was coaching against Tech at the time, 
Jim Nargain was head coach. Well, after four years at Ferris, and I was being you know, let go, uh, that one year in Minneapolis, there was a change in coaching again at Tech. And Herb Boxer was one of my coaches for two years here at Tech as an assistant. And he called me up and said, do you want to get back into coaching? And I said, yeah, I want to do it. So, and I always wanted to get back here to hold in Michigan Tech. So. Yeah, so that's what brought you back to the area. And then right. after coaching, how did you end up deciding you wanted to be an athletic director? Well, first off, after coaching, that decision was made by us losing our job. If your head coach loses your job, you know, the assistants usually kind of fall out with it. So um, I stayed on for six years at Michigan Tech after I was finished coaching. Uh, I ran their, their hockey school. I ran summer athletic programs. I, I helped out in their auxiliary enterprise uh, uh, area. So I was here six years after I had left coaching at Tech. So I was here for 11 years. So then after that, um, while I was doing that, the, the athletic director's job opened up at Holton. I put my name in it. And then you retired a couple of years ago I, now? I'm in, I'm in my fourth year of retirement right now. Are you enjoying it? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, it's kind of, it's nice, you know. And I was fortunate, I got out of it three years ago when COVID hit. Right, so, so you got out of it just before the, the all the mess. And yeah, you know, I, of the... I mean, it, yeah, it, it was just time for me. I, 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 I loved the job I had as an athletic director. I liked the kids that I met. I mean, I liked the coaches I had and other coaches and referees that I came into yeah. contact with. Uh, but that type of job, you know, you're, you're there a lot of evenings. And that, that started to wear on me a little bit. You know, you get there at 8, 8, 30 in the morning, and you get home at 8, 8, 8 9 o'clock at night. Right. And so after 23 years of that, I decided maybe that it's time. And I, you know, was old enough that I should get out and move <laughs> yeah. on and give somebody else an opportunity. Right. So. Well, I think that about wraps it up. So thank you for coming on this episode of the podcast. Enjoyed it. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. It's been a pleasure. Of course.